this, just to review these. These are the, the doc, uh, I, I should say, it's stronger than the word doctrine, because the word doctrine is a teaching. But we have, as Protestants, what we would call primary, secondary, and tertiary doctrines. And the primary doctrines, we could call it dogma. It's not a word we as Protestants use a whole lot, but we could call it that. It just comes from the Greek word for teaching. And, um, but these are things that must be accepted in order to be a member of your faith. And this, what I hope to see today is, as we get into the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic faith is a different faith because of the dogmas that they have set down. If they said, well, we think there's a purgatory, but we're going to hold that very loosely, well, even then I might say now that, that sort of invalidates the gospel. But if they held some of these things, for example, the perpetual virginity of Mary, if they held that um, loosely, as opposed to saying this is absolutely foundational core to our religion, um, maybe it wouldn't be so, so bad, you know, because there are things that are sort of just peripheral, hinted at in Scripture, and they may be beneficial to us, but um, we certainly don't hold those as, as core. This goes to their emphasis on Mary as a, as a centerpiece of their religion. The Eucharist, Mary, they could even, um, you know, they, they'll, they'll even draw metaphors between those and, and talk about, um, you know, Mary being the life-giving chalice, or the, you know, the, the chalice that holds the life-giving wine. So they might say the cup represents Mary because it contains um, Jesus' blood. They'll say that the ark of the covenant is Mary because she is the box that contained the covenant um, and all of these things. So um, <clears throat> they will go and read, read these dogmas back into Scripture and try to find places in Scripture that support them, um, such as with uh, 8D, the bodily assumption. They'll look at Revelation and see, oh, there is a woman clothed with the sun, 12 stars above her head. This must be Mary. And so we find Mary in heaven in the book of Revelation. That means she was assumed bodily into heaven. Um, now, what's really important to understand is what, is what is the rationale? What's the logic behind that? Why say that Mary was uh, raptured or assumed up into heaven instead of dying? That, when you answer that question, that really reveals what's at stake with this dogma, which is Mary was sinless. Mary was perfect. She was conceived immaculately. Uh, that was declared in 1854. Okay, that's not something that was declared in the year 26 or 36 or something, very, very early in the church. Uh, this was 1854. For, for a church, now for Protestants, that's not necessarily a problem because we're always going back to Scripture. For Catholics, that's an enormous problem. Because if they have an unbroken line of papal succession where the popes were teaching these core dogmas, where in the first 1,800 years of the church was that found? You can't find that. Um, nor can you find the bodily assumption. And as you get further in these dogmas, uh, the further and further away from the truth they get. Uh, no, Mary died. We know that because um, humans die, unless the Bible tells us that they were assumed or raptured up into heaven, such as Enoch and Elijah. Um, even Lazarus died again, right? So we really only know a couple of humans in the Bible that were taken up to heaven without dying. And uh, the Bible is explicit about that. Beyond that, is it, is it in God's capability to take someone up? Yes, but we have no evidence to, certainly we're not going to say that's a dogma, um, but rather we're going to say Mary was a sinner. Um, in fact, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you may be familiar with this, but it's, it's probably good for us to turn there if, if you don't know this. But um, in Luke chapter uh, 1, this, I think, is the, the strongest verse um, showing that, I mean, there's lots of verses that show that all, all humans have sinned, you know, uh, wages of sin is death, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, but this is the clearest, I think, that shows that Mary knew that she was a, a sinner. There were a couple other points in Jesus' life where he um, sort of rebuked her, you know. I think most clearly when, his, uh, when, he, when she and uh, her family were standing outside the door, 
and he said, who's my mother? You know, he, he, basically, he basically disowned her to make a point about their presumption at that, at that point. And so they, I think they were acting sinfully. There's also the wedding at Cana that was potentially a soft rebuke there, um, showing that Mary did indeed sin. But this is the clearest one, I think. So this is Mary's prayer after she's heard um, the angel declare that she will have Jesus. And this is verse 46 and 47. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So, and then if you, if you go on, and they'll, they'll pull, um, you know, they'll pull prayers to Mary from this language here. But if you actually read the context of it, he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary, Mary viewed herself as a servant of the Lord, not as this exalted queen mother of the Lord. Now she says, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. If you ever wonder when they're praying the rosary, why do they say, you know, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. That comes from what Gabriel's announcement saying Mary well beloved full of see now they change it slightly don't they I mean or at least it gets translated you know full of grace it makes it sound like Mary's the one full of grace distributing grace but but Gabriel said you know high, uh, you who are highly favored basically the one on whom God has shed all of this grace and then uh, they say hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed are thou among women and that's where this comes from from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. But look, she, she diverts the attention away from herself to, to God. And we do call Mary blessed, because not because of her righteousness, but because of how God chose to use her. Um, there are a lot of people that are blessed. We are blessed. But, you know, I hope no one's saying a prayer to me. <laughs> Because I would utterly reject that. And I think someone, someone pointed this out, too, is that um, people in heaven right now are probably not aware of the nitty-gritty of what's going on here on earth because Mary would have the most to grieve about in her spirit if she saw all of the uh, worship being directed to her. She knows how sinful she is, just as I know how sinful I am. Um, so that, that's speculative, but it's a great point in that Mary would not, Mary would be, would abhor the things she's saying because she is one of those lowly. Mary's also um, echoing the prayer of Hannah. If you read the prayer of Hannah, it's, it's very interesting, the parallels here. So um, she's not declaring herself uniquely um, at a unique spiritual office where people should divert their praise and prayer to her. There's a lot we could say about that. Um, so some have, now this I thought was actually, until I researched it, I thought it was more universal in the Catholic Church, but some have pushed towards making her co-redeemer with Christ. Um, the popes, the last three popes at least, have officially said no to this. We're not doing this. There's one redeemer. That's a, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, but there still is a strong element in the Catholic Church, um, if not to make her co-redeemer, but to in name, at least to make her the de facto um, go-to. And this is Catholic doctrine as well, that um, you'll hear Catholic apologists say like, hey, if you want something from Jesus, ask his mother, because he'll do whatever his mother asks. They'll even go back to the wedding at Cana and say, well, Jesus sort of, you know, pushed back on her a little bit, um, but he ended up doing what she requested anyway. And so that was Jesus listening to his mother. Blasphemous things like this, they will, they will say. Um, Jesus does not under, he's not under, um, you know, the, the triune God is not under the authority of anyone. Let's put it that way. Jesus in his incarnation is under the authority of the Father. Um, but as he is ascended now to the Father's right hand, all authority is given to him. He's not sharing that. We could go to the Old Testament where Yahweh says, I will not share my glory with anyone else. Certainly not a sinful human being. So, Ron, uh, Richard. <laughs> oh, 
fine. You're fine. Take your time. <clears throat> It'll come back. That happened to me yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it'll come back, it'll come back. Um, you know, an, an, another verse from 1 John, if anyone says he is without sin, what has he done? He's made God a liar. So the Roman Catholics make God a liar when they say um, that they're, I mean, Paul goes to great lengths in Romans to say there is, there is no one, no, not one, all alike are under sin, Romans chapter 2. To. He is bound all over to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Did Mary get a pass out of that just because she's going to be the... the and, and the logic of that too, well, okay, if Mary had to be the immaculate vessel in which Christ was conceived, what about Mary's mother? What about Mary's entire line? It, you know, there wasn't a, a, a race of sinless people. So it, they have to at some point inject a break between the sin of Adam and the sinlessness of Mary. And it really does destroy Romans chapter 5 as well, imputed sin. So we can see that the Roman Catholic Church leans toward Pelagianism because they deny, not officially, but they, their doctrines functionally deny original sin. They will say, yes, we believe in original sin, but if you sprinkle this water on your baby's head when it's born, we can bring you back to a neutral state. You can begin the process of grace infusion into the child. And one person here is, is certainly sinless. Um, the more charismatic Catholics will talk about uh, great saints of the past, and they might refer to those people being sinless or in a state of um, near sinless perfection. And the saints get exalted, and then you end up praying to the saints also. So. Um, it's not a religion that has a clear distinction between the sinless mediator and sinful human beings, um, nor does it emphasize the once-for-all sacrifice that takes away that sin. So. Okay, so hopefully you see the, the degression, is that a word? The, 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 the de devolution of... of um, orthodoxy there in the Marian dogmas. We affirm that Mary is the God-bearer, Theotokos, because, um, because Jesus is God, and she was bearing God. Beyond that, we don't see any real need to put an emphasis on Mary because we don't put an emphasis on Joseph, for example. Being the earthly father of the Lord, we think he's entitled to some honor. Um, nor do we pray to David, arguably the greatest king of Israel, or Josiah, um, nor do we pray to, you know, the, the great righteous saints, the prophets. None of these men and women, um, beyond a Hebrews 11 sense, deserve special honor in our minds. Um, they were sinners, and the Bible goes to great lengths to show the sinfulness of even the greatest men and women who ever lived. I mean, think about that. Abraham, Moses, David, all these, all these people, sin, uh, the Bible does not hide their sins at all. And yet when we get to the New Testament, we have to assume Mary is spotless. It, it doesn't work at all. So, Okay. There's a lot more we could say about that, but we can leave it there if we need to. What we really want to get to now is the Council of Trent. And this really marks the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today, or the, the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today. Um, where sort of all these things that were evolving and developing became codified. The Council of Trent, as you can see, was actually an 18-year process. We might think this gets done in a few weeks today or a few months. This is 18 years. Um, so it was, a, it was a whole series of, of, of uh, debates and arguments and statements being drafted. And it was in reaction to the Reformation. So... Um, if you think about the, the time of the Reformation, uh, 1517 was the 95 Theses, right? So it's been going on about 30 years at this point. Um, Calvin is still alive. Luther is 
I think, still alive at this point. He might be gone by, by now, by 1545. But, um, but, you know, certainly these things have been, and I put a little timeline in there so you can get a sense of where we are in European history. But this is a, this timeline is um, a depiction of all the wars that happened as a result of the Reformation, whether directly or indirectly. Um, and uh, if you need notes as well, that, um, I'm gonna grab, they're, they're actually in, there's some in the printer back there. I think they might not be out. Are they out over there? They're in the printer back here, actually. In the, in the office, there's, if you could grab, there are probably six more copies in there. I appreciate that. Um, so, because uh, this will be a heavily note reliant thing. Um, yeah, whether directly or indirectly, these wars happened as a result of the Reformation. So if, you, if you're familiar with Reformation history, you know that it, it wasn't all, I mean, Calvin and Luther, these men pretty well resisted the violence, certainly Calvin resi and Luther both, resisted the, the violence that was uh, happening, but people were taking the Reformation way too far. So of course we know the violence of the Catholic Church, the Crusades and the Inquisition, et cetera. But the, the reformers were doing absolutely horrible things too, some of them. Um, it was in large part because um, people glommed on to this movement. You know, there were, uh, revolutionary movements attract all kinds of unsavory characters. And there were people who genuinely wanted to cleanse the church and to live at peace, the true Christians. But then there's all these other people who just wanted to throw off the, the power of you know, you're a German living in Germany and you're tired of the Pope, t you know, overtaxing you and um, bringing his cart around asking for indulgences. So you're going to get out the, the pitchforks and you're going to start a revolution in the name of Christ. And that was called the Peasants' Rebellion in Germany. There were many of those. Um, and there were also more formalized versions of this where the different kings of Europe would now pick up the sword in the name of Christ and war with each other. And the, 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 the genuine reformers tried to, to various degrees, prevent this. Um, some of them actually picked up swords themselves, like Ulrich Zwingli, who we mentioned. Um, he actually died on the field of battle in one of these wars. So there were Christians who were misguided about um, the role of the church and the role of state and the role of warfare in that. Um, but it was a bloody time in in history. So we're not trying to uh, sanitize the Reformation and say that it was only uh, a pure church revival. It was also a very bloody time in Europe. Uh, so this is a reactionary period. It was a time of great change. The Enlightenment was happening. The scientific re revolution was happening in these few hundred years. Um, that's all a little bit in the future. But the Council of Trent in the mid-1500s, um, the New World had been discovered too. So, you know, all that is going on. The Reformation was happening, and this is the Catholic Church trying to do damage control, basically. We need to stem the tide. We need to figure out our response to this incredible upheaval. Um, so if we go to uh, D, <clears throat> uh, 9D, most people were well aware that the Catholic Church needed reform. This is something I only learned recently. You know, you, you tend to think of, like the Catholic Church is this monolithic thing and all of they, they're all together and they all resisted the reformation and that's not true there was a lot of infighting in the catholic church there was a lot of territorialism etc and many people many priests leaders saw the need for reformation they understood they wanted the, the church cleansed they saw uh, how politics had entered in how you know uh, sexual corruption money had entered into the church, and they wanted it cleansed. Um, so they weren't necessarily opposed to this. The, the Council of Trent was, and it did answer even some of those uh, complaints, and it did move towards some reformation. Yeah, I think that was in the 1300s or the 1200s, yeah. But it was, it, it was around that time, yeah. Um, is that on there? Oh, you looked it up? Okay. 13 what? Yeah, so about, for about 50 years, they had three popes. Yeah, there was a pope in France. 
Um, there were th three claimants to the, to the throne, uh, the papal throne. It was just like, if, if you study European history, it is an absolute, thank you, Ro, appreciate that. It is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> if you've ever tried to study the kings and queens of Europe, even just following the British crown, absolute nightmare. Um, good luck. It, it's, it's a lot of people, and they all have this, yeah, they're all James and Henry, right? Or if the, in France, they're all Louis. Um, it, it is really a nightmare to study for, for this American anyway. Um, that, that was the political and cultural situation of the time. It's everybody scrapping over power, basically. Um, so, but amongst that, you did have people saying, yeah, we need uh, better translations of the Bible. In fact, we, we read about William Tyndale and these men who died for translating the Bible into English, but I learned this only recently as well. On the continent of Europe, they were actually very pro-translation for the most part. Um, it, was, it was more in England itself that that anti-literacy um, uh, thing was challenged. So, um, <clears throat> so literacy exploding as well, the printing press. People are starting to read the Bible in their own language for themselves. And um, we see in E, men like John Wycliffe. He's AKA the morning star of the Reformation. It's kind of the nickname we've given him because he was very, very early, an early reformer. Um, Jan Hus, or whose name translates John Goose, um, was, is absolutely a person we should know more about. Uh, Luther, uh, yeah, there's a great story we're getting into about, about uh, Hus and, and Luther. And uh, they burned Hus at the stake. Luther came along 100 years later, and everybody's saying, uh, you don't want to be like, the, like Jan Hus, right? So just don't go his direction. And Luther had heard that his whole life. When he gets to the, uh, uh, the debate, the great debate with Eck, and he's um, you know, defending the faith, he's like, why does everyone keep saying don't become like Jan Hus? He goes home that night, reads about Jan Hus, and he comes back the next day, I'm a Hussite, he says. I'm, I follow Jan Hus. And... Um, you know, it was just this, it was sort of, it, that story kind of shows, because Huss was obviously a believer in the, in the Bible and the gospel, and it shows just how ignorant um, so many people in Europe had become. They had no idea. It's not like they had Wikipedia or something uh, to Google who Jan Huss is, but he went and he had to find those books and learn what Jan Huss was actually burned at the stake for, and he's like, oh yeah, that's what I believe. But by doing that, Luther basically condemned himself because Huss had been de uh, declared a heretic. So... Great story there. We know Luther, uh, John Calvin. Uh, we know, uh, we might know a little bit about John Knox in Scotland and William Tyndale, uh, who I love. Um, he was burned at the stake. Wycliffe actually escaped that, that fate, but um, they exhumed his corpse later and then burned the corpse as if that was going to do anything. Um, these men had, had shaken Europe and they had looked to various degrees to purify the church. So many others were sympathetic to that cause. They didn't necessarily think of rejecting Catholicism, right? The word Catholic, again, means universal. So there was the church. If you were in Europe, you were part of the church. Just like we would say, I want to go to church on Sunday because I'm a Christian. That's how they would look at it. There weren't alternatives. So, you know, let's say that we had a problem at Lakeview, and we had a problem with the teaching, right? And... You know, if, 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 if you're attending a church, or maybe you have in the past, you've attended a church, you're like, I don't, I don't agree with this, and this is a, an important thing to me. What would be the proper course of action? Just skedaddle? I think the Bible shows, you know, you should attempt to go to the elders, or whoever's teaching this, and try to reason with your brother. And if you can't win them and you go through that process, then you peacefully say, okay, let's, leave, let's live at peace, but let's do the, the Abraham and Lot thing where we say, I need to go over here, and you need to go over here, and we'll live at peace that way. Um, there's a process of resolving that, you know. And that's essentially, on a grand scale, what the Reformation was. They're not just saying, oh, this church is corrupt, so we're out of here. But rather, they were going to their brothers and trying to show them. The 95 Thesis, right? We could look at this as a, um, as a bold challenge, uh, you know, a statement maybe, but, but really it was an invitation to debate that he was putting on the community bulletin board, which was the church door. 
So Luther didn't want to just leave. He wanted to reason and debate. Let's talk about these things. Let's work together. And he, you know, love hopes all things, right? 1 Corinthians 13. He was not naive. The, the, the 95 Theses are strongly worded, but he, he was actually saying, let's sit down and talk about this so we can come to a biblical agreement. It's a hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, when you know in your heart, you, you, you know that these people are not going to listen. But at the same time, we, we can't be like Jonah and just assume, you know, just let God destroy him because, you know, they're not going to listen to him. <clears throat> okay, so that's all sort of the background of the Council of Trent. Um, it really was multiple meetings over the course of 18 years. In response to the Reformation, um, I almost thought about discussing the doctrines of Calvinism um, and the Reformers at this point to kind of highlight what they were going against. But this is also an interesting way to study what we believe because you can look at what the opponents were saying and you'll be able to tell what the reformers were preaching by what the Council of Trent was. So it's a bit, a bit like reading the screw tape letters, if you've ever read that. Just do the opposite, <laughs> believe the opposite. Um, Council of Trent, I, I took the following anathemas here, the following things that, there's a long list that we're gonna read. Um, I, I cherry picked, okay? Disclaimer, disclaimer, I cherry picked here. There are things in the Council of Trent we would absolutely affirm. I pulled out the problematic ones. So I'm not trying to portray the Catholic Church as 100% wrong. Uh, they hold the doctrine of the Trinity just, just as we do. Um, even some of their statements on original sin are very sound. It's all the things that they add to it. And then, so that disclaimer made, um, this is all cherry picked and summarized. It's much longer than this, in fact. So we'll spend, uh, the rest of the time of this portion of the study going over these anathemas. Now, anathema is the Greek word uh, for accursed or condemned, okay? This comes from um, several points in the New Testament in Corinthians uh, when Paul says, if any man does not uh, receive these things, let him be anathema, let him be condemned. He's basically instructing the church to say, okay, not that we, you know, start pouring out our wrath on that person or start acting in the place of God. But what it's essentially saying, leave that person aside, pray for them, love them, but don't fellowship with them as a Christian. They, are, they stand condemned right now. If they die in that state, they will be condemned. That's essentially what we're saying. So we're not, we're not showing any sort of malice or wrath towards these people. That's for God alone to exercise. Um, but the Catholic Church is saying anathema. They're saying these people are cut off from or excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Okay. So, um, any questions or comments before we jump into this? This is going to be a little bit here. And we'll want to we'll want to draw some scriptural references here too. So feel free to jump in at any point if you want to talk about these and and bring up um, scripture. Okay. To begin with. Um, this is going to be 10a. If anyone denies that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is conferred in baptism, the guilt of original sin is remitted, or even asserts that the whole of that which has the true and proper nature of sin is not taken away, but says that it is only raised, R-A-S-E-D, not sure the definition of that. Um, I have to look that up. Or not imputed, let him be anathema. Okay, so what is this saying? If you deny that baptism takes away your sin and that grace, the grace that is in baptism, now think of how they view baptism, everyone's baptized. If you're in the Catholic Church, you are baptized. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So the grace is taken away from everyone. Well, they weren't they weren't stupid. They could see that people in the Catholic Church were not living as Christians. And so they didn't have an explanation for it. They had to come up with a whole system of, um, of lesser sins and greater sins, mortal and venial sins. Mortal will be the greater one. Um, to explain why it is that all of these baptized people um, are not all acting as Christians. 
But they're saying, if you deny, as the reformers were doing, that the guilt of original sin is taken away in baptism. Okay? Now, I think that's, we've got to be a little cautious there because do I, as, as a baptized believer in Christ, do I now have original sin? Um, well, in one sense, I'm, I'm cleansed of my sin, so my sin is not upon me. But while we're in the flesh, we still, have this, we still have the stain, the imprint of original sin upon us. We are a new creation in Christ, and we are not under Adam. We are not in Adam. But I think when you look at Romans chapter 7, and he talks about the Christian wrestling with sin, because I haven't completely lost this Adamic nature, this Adamic flesh. Um, otherwise, you'll get into all kinds of <laughs> troubling things. I think Charles Wesley, uh, John Wesley um, had trouble with this idea, uh, l- leaning more into semi-Pelagianism because he talked about this, it's possible for humans in this life to achieve a, st- a state or get a very close state of sinless perfection um, where original sin has basically been wiped away and imputed sin. And uh, so you've got to be real careful with this one. I think the bigger issue I have with this statement is uh, that it's conferred through baptism. So they are saying that this will wipe away and take away that and bring you back to a state of moral neutrality. So they will genuinely believe that children are not sinners if they've been baptized. How could they be sinners? There's no original sin there. There's no imputed sin to them. Um, these will all be qualified. There will be a lot of gray area given there. But this is the statement that they make. Um, so they, the reformers were asserting that the whole of that which has the true and proper nature of sin is not taken away. So they're saying, yes, we would say amen. When we are baptized as believers, um, first of all, we're already believers before we're baptized. That's an important Protestant declaration. Okay, You don't come to the waters of baptism as an unbeliever. We ask you first, are you a believer? And if you're a believer, your sins have been washed away. That happened at the cross. The baptism, like we talked about with the supper, is just an outward symbol. It's an outward sign of the inward transformation. That's why the New Testament says there is one baptism for the remission of sins. There's not all of our individual baptisms in a sense. There's one baptism that, that, that matters. At Pentecost, they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit on the same day. They were all regenerated. They were all saved. They, were all, belie- they all believed at the same time. And, that, and you know, 3,000 of them came to faith in, on the day of Pentecost. I, you know, I'm sure they weren't all baptized at once. Uh, maybe they had a huge party at the Jordan River that day. But um, they were saved at that moment. Thief on the cross. Lots of other examples we could look at. <clears throat> okay. Like I said, interrupt any time. Um, these are important. These are the central doctrines of our faith. This is the most important stuff. So, uh, B, if anyone saith that since Adam's sin, the free will of man is lost and extinguished, or, or that it is a thing with only a name, yea, a name without a reality, a figment in fine introduced into the church by Satan, let him be anathema. So the reformers, like Luther, he wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. He's saying our, we do not have free will. This is, this is basic, you know, Romans theology. Um, do we make an actual choice to choose God? Yes, we make an actual choice. But that doesn't mean our will is free. That's, that's, um, the view we would hold is, com- is called compatibilism. That God is absolutely sovereign over our um, uh, this is from the Westminster and from the London Baptist and, and many other documents. God is absolutely sovereign over our salvation, but that does not do violence, it says, to the creature's, wi- um, to the creature's will. Now, using will is a tricky word because they, they would never say that the will is free. But it, it's, they say it's in such a way that we are not automatons. We do actually make conscious choices that we are morally responsible for. So the gospel, when it's given as a command, repent and believe the gospel, that is a real command. This is, remember, where Pelagius got hung up on. 
but at the same time, it, um, Augustine said, supply what you command. So yes, I, it is a real choice that needs to be made, but the Holy Spirit was the one who enabled me to make that choice. How that works, we say those things are compatible. We don't know how, but we, we, we acknowledge that that's what the Bible teaches. Um, of course, this is anathema to the Catholic Church. They would say, no, the person has their sins washed away, the stain of the original sin is taken away, so now you are basically, that baptized baby is Adam in the garden again. He is able to choose life or death. And the Bible says the opposite. The Bible says, I was conceived in iniquity. Um, I was, you know, brought up to be a sinner. And um, Romans says that we were all dead. Or Ephesians says we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And Romans also says, you know, the same thing. So when we, so we, you know, at Adventure Club every Wednesday, we preach the gospel to very, very young sinners who need repentance, and we don't apologize for that. Um, they're not covenant children. There's no such thing as a covenant child. These children who are brought into our homes for, uh, for you know, I have, I'll speak for myself. I have four kids. I, I know uh, my son has professed, and he's been baptized to be a believer, but ultimately God knows the souls and the hearts of those four children, and I don't claim any promises as to their eternal destination and salvation. Um, I have faith in the, in the goodness and mercy of God, but I, I acknowledge his sovereignty and say he will do um, right. The judge of all the earth will do right. And, but to that end, I do pray for them, and I, and I do believe that God um, blesses the teaching and preaching of his word to our offspring. Um, but of course, that's a very different viewpoint than even some like Presbyterians are moving in this direction or, or hold this viewpoint um, that, uh, and have held this viewpoint since the Reformation. It's really a holdover of Catholicism. Infant baptism, this idea of covenant child. Okay, now this child's been baptized, so the, now they're in the new covenant. And I think we can talk a lot about what the new covenant actually is based on this. The new covenant says the law is written on a person's heart so that all of them will know me from the youngest to the oldest. If somebody's a new covenant member, they're a believer, and that, that belief can never be taken away from them. They are, they are in the covenant forever. They will go to heaven eternally with the Lord. Uh, there is no conditional new covenant. And you know there are some denominations, Protestant denominations, that try to teach this today. Um, so very problematic, to say the least. Um, notice that they say, you know, the reformers were saying that the free will of man has been introduced into the church by Satan. I think they're talking about Pelagianism. When they say free will, I know this word is very touchy, and there's a lot, there's a lot of Arminians, brothers and sisters, who, who have been raised with this viewpoint. So I want to clarify exactly what that means. To have free will means you can choose of yourself morally, morally, right? Not actually, but like, like morally, you can make the decision between good and evil. So, you, so when we say free will, it's important to understand this. You're saying that that child or that person who is baptized could actually choose to never sin again in their life, and that could be achievable. Sinless perfection could be attained. And if they, if they, um, if they sin, it, it's, it's entirely because they made that neutral state choice between good and evil. This doesn't teach that we're actually slaves to sin. A slave doesn't get to choose. A slave um, doesn't get the moral, uh, a slave to sin does not have the moral capability. When, when Paul talks about being a slave to sin, he's actually talking about our desire. We always do what we desire to do. We can't love God. There's no ability for this, for the unbeliever to love God because he loves his sin, he loves himself, he loves um, the world. So it's all of a, it's all of a moral category here. Um, we don't want to make any statement saying like, well, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer when I was young. Was that not a choice? Yes, it was a choice. And that may have been this, the outward workings of your true faith that God gave you. But never forget that that was God doing that, and that wasn't because you were at a morally neutral standpoint. Otherwise, that's Pelagianism, and, and we've studied that. So, 
<clears throat> Let's look at C. If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, you know where this is going. <laughs> if we believe by faith alone, sola fide, you're anathema. If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of the Holy Spirit? Nope. It says, the movement of his own will. Let him be anathema. So in plain English, they're saying, if you believe that you were saved by faith alone, through the movement of the Holy Spirit and not of yourself, you're, you're cursed. And this is what the Roman Catholic Church holds to today. We can't join hands. They don't have the gospel. This is a different gospel. Paul is going to clearly say in Romans that there is not by Romans chapter 4, it is not by works. If it were by works, then you've earned your payment. And so if your will is free, and you make that free moral choice like Adam did in the garden. Adam failed to do, actually, I should say. Um, then, uh, you know, that, that's the state that they're looking at. We baptize you so that you can choose God. Think of it that way. It's completely opposite. We're saying we're, we baptize you because God has chosen you. They're saying we need to baptize these babies so that they can make that choice between good and evil. Um, so just, I mean, just kind of read that one really carefully because this was called the hinge on which the entire Reformation turned, the, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That was, if there was nothing else, yeah, Karen. I mean, in one sense, no. No, I, I don't know how they get around that. Um, you know, John Piper is, I, I love this quote, he said, you know, Romans 9 is a tiger that goes around devouring free willers like myself. Um, that's, he's referring to how he, he, Romans 9 brought him into that understanding of that. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know how they get around that, but in, in the ultimate sense, but um, they, I know that a lot of, um, uh, semi-Pelagians, Arminians, will look at Romans 9 through 11 in a collective sense. And there's even a lot of progressive liberals that, that will look at it as very collective. They don't, the, the reformers looked at Romans 9, they looked at the entire book of Romans as primarily individual, right? You need to be saved alone. What they might look at that and say, can you, what's the verse again? Oh, it's like 16. 15 and 16, right. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. We who are in the Reformation stream um, would look at that, and, and this might make total sense to you because this is the way you've heard it your whole life. This is an individual thing. When God says, I will have mercy on, and it's actually an active verb in the original Hebrew, I will mercy whom I will mercy. Basically, I will, I will do this direct action and I'm going to mercy that person by, you know, Noah and all these others who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and I will have compassion whom I have compassion. And, and then elsewhere it says, I will harden whom, I'm har whom I harden. And then he, Paul exegetes that and says, so it depends not on human will. Boom, right there. I mean, that's against this exactly right here. It's not of human will. Paul says that in Ephesians 2, so that no one may boast. But on God, who has mercy. They, but then, what, here's what they're going to do with that, Karen. They're going to say, um, I think, they're going to say, um, this is a collective. So God has had mercy on the people collectively of God. He's had mercy on the church. And you can enter this ark, you can enter this covenant um, by becoming part of the church. So God is going to bless the mother church, the, the European church, with his covenant. And, and now, again, because they're, they're drawing this strong connection between Old Testament Israel and the church, and they're saying basically it's all one, 
they're saying, as we bring those categories in, could you enter into the covenant of Israel? Yeah, you could be circumcised, you could keep the law, and now you're under the covenant. You're under the Mosaic covenant. And it was, there, there didn't necessarily have to be an inward transformation the way they understood it in the old covenant. Um, you could be under, under the law of Moses. Now, Jesus, of course, said, no, some, not all Israel is Israel, you know, and, and um, you're not sons of Moses, you're sons of your father, the devil. Um, he, he, he looked at the inward. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm kind of stumbling over my words here, is that they're going to look at this as a collective, and, and a lot of Armenians, Pelagians do this today, and they'll say that God has mercy on um, a people collectively, and you can then enter in and be one of those people. But the reformers, Luther, Calvin, they looked at this and being like, no, he's talking about individuals. He's talking about Pharaoh. He's talking about Moses. He's talking about these individual people um, whom God chooses to show mercy to or to let them remain justly in their sin. You know? Exactly, exactly. And they'll say, well, Jacob stands for collective the believers, Esau collective the unbelievers. So I think, I think they wave the collective wand on that one and, and get around it that way. I've, I've heard a lot of um, Arminian Protestants use that argument for Romans 9 as well. I think that's the, the chief argument that they're going to use to get around this. Because if you haven't sat down through Romans 9 and the doctrines of grace, you know, I was brought up in a church that never even really cracked that chapter. And then when I found it, I was like, this is in the Bible? Seriously? <laughs> wow, I can't believe this. Um, so the sovereignty of God and salvation is absolutely there. Let's just do one more here, and then we'll pick it up next week. Um, if anyone saith that justifying faith is nothing else but confidence in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that this confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. If you believe in salvation through faith in Christ alone, you are accursed. Okay, um, the alone is the key part there. They will say, yes, we believe in Christ. We have to believe in, in his free gift of salvation, but that's not alone. For them. Now, book of James, let's put a caution in there because the book of James says, yes, but, the, yes, but, because he was talking to antinomians, yes, but when we have, James would absolutely affirm salvation by, by faith alone. Um, in Christ. But when we see that faith, what does that faith look like? That's what the book of James is all about. Does that faith look like it has absolutely no works? I think James was talking to, to what in the 20th century they called carnal Christians. People who said, well, I prayed a prayer when I was young, now I can go and live however I want. And a lot of Catholics end up in this category as well. There's a lot of Protestants who do. Tons of Protestants. A lot of Catholics end up in this way as well, because the system of uh, confession, repentance, receiving the communion, um, you can go out and live how you want to live, essentially. The reformers came and say, no, what did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? It's all about your heart. If you're going out and just reveling in your sin and coming back to be cleansed on Sunday, and this should be convicting to all of us, I know it's convicting to me, um, you know, then you need to examine yourself. That's the, the main instruction with the Eucharist, right, with communion, is examine yourself. See whether you be in the faith. And as we saw in 2 Corinthians at the end, when Paul says that, he says, I've passed the test. I've examined myself, and I've passed the test. It doesn't mean I'm sinless, but it means I have faith, and that faith is genuine and will save me. And that faith moves me to mortify my sin and to, to, to make progress in, in this life. But that's what James was referring to is essentially those Catholics and those, those Christians who just say, you know, dirty, dirty your hands, wash, rinse, repeat. Um, that's the system that it turned into. Everything, every kind of non-Christian system all goes back to works righteousness at the end. It's the default mode of human life is I'm going to get to heaven by my own works. Um, so... I, I, that's probably a good place to pause there. Um, hopefully you can see the, the trouble with this, but you can also see by reflection, by the opposite, what the reformers were teaching. And, and we can praise God that 
Um, these men were boldly going out there and standing up against incredible numbers opposed to them and saying these things very strongly. So I think one, thing, one thought to leave you with also um, is, you know, it, it's very tempting in this day and age to look at the Catholic Church as the, the softer, gentler church. A lot of Protestants want to join hands with Catholics. We need to go back to the Council of Trent and hold them to this. There is no peace between their church and our church in a spiritual sense. Real shalom, you know, real peace of God. Of course, we are kind to Catholics. We may have Catholics coming and joining us for the walk for life. Um, that's fine. We can join hands on some of those issues, social issues, um, criminal issues, you know, in this case. Um, but. But we also need to understand your faith anathematizes us and our faith anathematizes you. These are different religions entirely. We might use a lot of the same lingo, but there is no peace between Rome and us.